Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Daphne Ayas, and I'm the director of Vita Revit. We're here to welcome Zoe Butt, curator and director of Sun Art in Ho Chi Minh City. We're talking about the ethos of collaboration and the different practices artists and curators have been embarking on in China, Vietnam, and Cambodia in some sort of combination, according to Zoe's selection. We thought it's very important to have her here. Thanks to Mondrian also, we're able to have her here, Mondrian van den Hako, the reader. Um, we thought it's really important to talk about collaboration at a time in Netherlands when some of the programmatic choices are being ideologically imposed on institutions to collaborate with each other. Um, we really, as we did of it, obviously we're very open to collaboration and we've been collaborating with institutions in the past, also with my new tenure, but yet the fact that it's being imposed by uh, city and uh, government choices, we found it a little bit strange. So um, we also would love to tap into the intelligence of more players in Asia while we're in Rotterdam. I mean, also looking at the Rotterdam Harbor, seeing quarter of it Chinese. Um, we think there are some cultural elements already existing in the city that we have to consistently think what's going on in parts of Asia and what can we learn from it, not only what, what kind of exchanges we can have. Uh, Zoe Bat and I, we met, I think, in 2007. She was in Beijing, the curator and uh, head of the international programs of the Longmart space or Long March project. Long March uh, project, project at that time. At mm. that time, it keeps evolving always, <laughs> as it does in China. And, um, and I was at the time based in Shanghai and was working on a Long March project in New York. Um, so we met over email then. And since then, she moved also to Vietnam and has been embarking on various collaborations in Cambodia and across Asia. She is, as I said, the director of Sun Art in Ho Chi Minh, but also before Long March, she was the curator at the uh, Queensland Art Gallery, Australia. Brisbane, exactly, and yeah. working on the Asia Pacific Triennial. So we welcome her tonight and look forward to the discussion that will ensue afterwards. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I was curious exactly how much interest there would be for this part of the world in Rotterdam a place that I've only had the privilege of coming once, which was 12 years ago. <laughs> um, so again, big thank you to Mondrian for the invitation to come and spend a week visiting some of the institutions in a country that right now is one of Sound Art's principal supporters. Um, and I'll go on a little further to talk about institutional collaboration later. Um, big thank you to Daphne also. Um, what I've found in my field is that it's very small and the longer you stay in it, the more you realize friendships that you started many years ago with not knowing where it would end up come to some fabulous fruition later on. So never underestimate the people that you speak to or meet anywhere. You don't know how it's going to help you later on. So how attitude becomes form? collaborating in Asia. What I'm about to share with you was first given in excerpt and initially uh, written for a seminar held jo jointly by Columbia University and the Asia Art Archive in America in New York in April this year. And that panel was aptly titled China in Asia, Asia in China. And it's a neat interlude to today's discussion that focuses on the idea of collaboration in Asia, indeed continuing a topic that hopefully will offer some prescient considerations and insight into the necessity for new frameworks of showcasing contemporary art and culture internationally. For me, critical to the idea of collaboration is exchange and dialogue. How can these two transit lanes offer rich ground for new histories to emerge, and thus, new patterns of economy. We should not be blind to the role money has to play in marking out significant collaborations while also paying due respect to the role of context, historical memory, and custom as very integral to meaningful exchange and dialogue. So I believe that the success of an artistic project often arises at the moment of a culture collision. And in late July 2009, 
in Beijing at an evening of much baijiu, Chinese rice wine, cigarettes, cringe style pop, canto pop. And while sitting in the antique wooden chairs of a country long proud to be named the Middle Kingdom, I found myself in a curious conversation about the nature of a cultural and artistic alliance. Confronted by a room full of very respected Chinese contemporary artists, not only respected, but highly monetarily successful. I asked one of the most senior artist curators of his generation of his thoughts on collaborating with artists from Southeast Asia. To which, without pause, he said, why should we consider it a good strategy to partner with the rear of the vanguard? I was not surprised by the logic of such a statement, as it did reflect several years of particular research and experience of working between China, Vietnam, and Cambodia. I was disheartened at how clearly this cultural attitude has affected the nature, form, and potential of China's cultural and artistic contemporary exchange. I found it disappointing that China, who I believed had significant potential to model a new regional paradigm for how we can discuss and circulate contemporary art history and production, should it be so hoodwinked in historical chauvinism, laced with the lure of global, red western economy. Now, just where does this chauvinism, where is it anchored? And it's a question, it's a very good question. And perhaps some essentialists would remind us that the Han Chinese as early as the fourth century considered Southeast Asian people to be an unhistorical barbarian race destined to be subjugated by others, largely determined by their darkness in skin tone and perceived failure in forming what we call cohesive national groups according to historical historicization. Now, though this view is historically worthy of one interpretation, the issue at hand, namely the complex possibility of cultural col collaboration in Asia, looking particularly at China, Vietnam, and Cambodia, cannot be so easily determined. So, in today's ever-expanding circuit of curatorial intelligentsia who travel the globe in search of talent, who land in cities with little arts and cultural infrastructure, particularly like places of Cambodia and Vietnam, where artistic value is largely determined by the benefits of the international art market with its colonial overtones that dictate preferred aesthetic, dismissing a great amount of local art production as derivation rather than arguing a contextualized originality. One could look at Vietnamese artist Wun Trung and the resemblance of this to Sai Thuombly or the influence of China's cynical realism and pop aesthetic comparing the work of the Luo brothers with Ha Man Thang. Two Vietnamese artists, Ha Man Thang and Wun Trung, who are readily dismissed as derivation artists from Vietnam. I completely disagree, however. In Greater Asia particularly, the issue of appropriation and derivation coupled with a market-driven landscape is dangerously limiting the growth and development of a critically thinking, locally specific cont contemporary cultural discourse and infrastructure. So, firstly, to give a little background on these various art scenes of China, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and how their social context affects the interpretation, understanding, and collaboration within contemporary art. In contrast to the explosion of hardware and software in China's contemporary art scene, its museum buildings, commercial galleries, contemporary art precincts, art fair halls, collectors, sales managers, bank sponsors, and experimental uh, artist-initiated university contemporary art curricula, Vietnam, in comparison, has little where to speak of. It has no dedicated contemporary art museum, no collectors purchasing contemporary Vietnamese art that is circulated abroad, a French university curricula that has not changed since 1924, and does not teach contemporary art history. It also has no critical comparative resources or textual visual archives of 20th century culture and society. Vietnam's first millennia was under subjugation to China and the country remains proud of their ability to oust China's rule single-handedly. Vietnamese Ministry of Cultural officials look to the dollar success of their artistic big brothers in contemporary China and question how Vietnamese artists can do the same but they are extremely hesitant to engage China on such a cultural conversation when political tension between the two countries remains at one of its highest points in the last decade, 
over territorial disputes over the South China Sea. Just one step back, this is a typical salon style factory gallery that you see spotted across Vietnam. So despite the rare occurrence of permitted public protests in 2011 in Hanoi and Saigon over this territory, the South China Sea, the Vietnamese government is also very mindful of China's much needed investment in various resource industries, such as the mining of rare mineral that greatly affects policy making in the country. In contrast, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, where China is today the country's leading investor of infrastructural development, where Pol Pot's Chinese-backed regime destroyed 95% of the intellectual population and its resources, where the current prime minister is considered the puppet of the Vietnamese government, there are a total of 10 students enrolled in the fine arts program of the University of Fine Arts, and the country is problematically controlled by a foreign NGO who are also the sole supporters and interpreters of the visual arts. There is no financial support for artists, and most collectors are expats, who would rather spend 500 US dollars on a fancy meal than support local culture. And thus the price point of sale is not consistent with what it would possibly gain abroad. Though China's contemporary art landscape is diversifying, with a strong network of differing players on the production, collecting, and educational end, Private museums in Songduang still languish with the scampering feet of the sales pitch curator, where providing any critical form of interpretation of an art object is either a flowery, nonsensical paragraph evincing the stereotypical power of Chinese tradition, or at the opposite academic end, it is an algorithm of theoretical jargon, attempting to challenge Western theories with Chinese thought, which makes the art-loving pundit shrug with a lot of confusion. While exhibitions of Chinese contemporary art in Vietnam and Cambodia are next to null, there are relatively few exhibitions of Southeast Asian art scene in China, save for a handful of commercial galleries, artists, and independent curators such as Peak in Finance, Tang Contemporary, uh, Biliana Sirix exhibition, Strategies from Within in 2008, and the collaborative programs of Cha Chang Di Workstation, initiated by filmmaker and documentarian Wu Wen Guang. What is of crucial context for all these contexts here is uh, audience. To who are artistic and curatorial endeavors and collaborations important on the local level? If an artist can gain critical reception in New York or Berlin on terms that are relevant to a Western argument of aesthetic history, how is this made relevant on a more local or regional level of production? Where does the role of interpretation and its possible political persuasion hold effective power and influence on the local level. Particularly relevant to this discussion is how does the hardware and software of a local or regional arts infrastructure, its formation of relationship between producers and interpreters, how does this affect an artist's social attitude towards foreign artistic exchange and dialogue? So very much I'm trying to posit the relationship between infrastructure producers, artists, and how a certain cultural attitude needs to exist for successful exchanges. Within Vietnam, China is perceived as a success story, not because they are particularly compelled by the messages within their art, nor that they particularly respect its various forms. Their determination of success largely resounds with the auctioneer's gavel of sale. In Vietnam, particularly what concerns the Communist Party's cultural ministry is how to make Vietnamese contemporary art a financial and tourist asset in the same way of China. However, their key issue is how to ensure the artists, patrons, and public do not critically challenge the relationship between production, discourse, and display as practiced within the international art market. Artists such as Ai Weiwei are well noted in Vietnam, and it is not mere coincidence that his manipulation of social media is encouraging Vietnamese firewalls, and now also censoring local website contents, such as the recent show of Wun Tai Thuan, as sad art, which I'll talk about further on. The systems that generate interpretation of culture are kept under relative political surveillance in China, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And increasingly, in my experience, it is through independent intercultural collaborative exchange and the necessity of translation in this context that new modes of dialogue, new praxis of making can confuse government control and thus open up discursive space. Locating knowledge networks, practical infrastructure, and embracing flexibility and project goal are paramount to ensure productivity. 
A pertinent case study here is the artist-founded entity called the Long March Project, and its initiation of the Ho Chi Minh Trail Project began in 2009. This complex and controversial undertaking has had exhibition discussion platforms unravel in Beijing, Phnom Penh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vientian in Laos, and Shanghai. The Long March entity is composed of the Long March Project, charged with the mission to investigate critical discourse surrounding art and culture, and Long March Space, a commercial operation set up financially to so financially support the artistic experimental nonprofit endeavors of the foundational arm, which is Long March Project. So the Ho Chi Minh Trail Project endeavored, and this is a quote from uh, its website, uh, endeavored to be a collaborative contemporary arts project whose mission was to implement physical, discursive, and artistic activities among China, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, uh, calling for a questioning of fixed relations within social production as determined by ideas of history, identity, market logic, and the subconscious effects of a geographically imposed divide, end quote. It encompassed public and private forum, workshop, curatorial residency, research trips, a month-long physical journey through these countries, and was also recently prominently featured in the eighth Shanghai Biennale called Rehearsal of 2010. So in 2008, in my then role as director of international programs of Long March Project, I was excited for the Ho Chi Minh Trail endeavor as I thought it would challenge the persisting narcissism found at the heart of a great quantity of Chinese contemporary art. An opinion also shared by Lu Jie, the founder. And the project began in 2009, July, with an intense one month, what we called a Long March Education Residency Program with artists and curators from this region. And you can see all of us standing here in Beijing. What I learned from these 30 days of discussion with individuals from Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, Phnom Penh, Seoul, New York, Hangzhou, and Beijing was that this project marvelously encompassed so much historical trauma and disconnected cultural memory, so much subsequent social distrust, nationalistic pride, and psychological misgivings that I could see how this dialogue was starting to break down many cultural and political assumptions that I believed held great potential for the subsequent creation of provocative artworks and reinventions of historical moments. However, Ludia, who you can see on the far right, the founder, he began to doubt the plausibility of collaboration with these parties in fear that the ensuing aesthetic and dialogue would not be of international critical relevance and translatability. Constructive yet very heated discussions were had in Beijing concerning the problematic democratic framework of an art collaborative project about the need for a directed curatorial vision in the success of an aesthetic and intellectual project, about the need for a directed curatorial vision in, oh sorry, I repeat, about the complex need to move on from the historical prejudice of the past and look towards new forms of social interaction and partnerships, but how to maintain quality and standard. Consequently, the whole framework of the project was changed with the decision to have Long March Project dictate the shape and form of all encounters. I understood the need for these questions and the push-pull relationship between satisfying local and international project goals for a growing organization gaining national and international credence. But in realizing that the basis of my securing this regional network of friendship, namely giving the chance particularly for Vietnamese and Cambodian people to speak and direct action and form on an equal contributing platform with Chinese participants, realizing that this was not a possibility, I found myself in a very big ethical dilemma as the curatorial facilitator of the project. While I acknowledge that the curatorial cohesion of a project based on so many conflicting opinions and differing contextual realities would be tough to conjure a visual exhibition or intellectual discourse with the expected rigor, I also knew that this project opened up the possibilities for a new form of cultural engagement that could, on a local level, enact dynamic social change that will greatly benefit the artistic communities involved in the longer term. But the Ho Chi Minh Trail project was ultimately a curatorial endeavor, an artistic statement with a desired aesthetic that was integrally about China. So here we can see a couple of the 
workshops and forums that were held between residents and visiting artists. And actually, one, the speaker that you'll have here, Tio Zizie, is sitting on the couch in the far right in the blue T-shirt. And there's Jane from the Asia Art Archive. So the accompanying catalogue of the project, which attempts to document the history of the project, particularly the physical journey through this region by participants of which I was not a part, this is an art statement unto its own, as image after image of Chinese artists in romanticised travel mode, production mode, discussion mode, command. And these are images taken directly out of the very chunky publication designed to showcase the Ho Chi Minh Trail project, of which, funnily enough, literally all of the images are only of Chinese artists. Um, actually, also these images, of which are a total of six images, are the only ones I was given for press. I was not allowed to show anything else. So only Win Nu Hui from Ho Chi Minh City and Viet Le, who was Vietnamese descent living between Phnom Penh and LA, only these two people from the region were actively participating in this project from Vietnam and Cambodia that was largely a philosophical and rhetorical exercise, largely prioritizing Chinese perspective. <clears throat> While I feel the intellectual strength of the decision of the Long March project to dictate project aims and could see the coherence in this strategy, I also found it greatly contradicted the Long March project desire to open up the Pandora's box of interwoven cultural histories in this region. My own misgivings were matched by the skepticism of artists in Vietnam and Cambodia, many of whom preferred to refrain from organizational involvement and participation as a result of the change in this project direction. Their skepticism arose from various issues such as the titling of the project. The trail known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail is of great political sensitivity in Vietnam, and any local examination of its history and relevance is strongly vetted by the government. General confusion about what they were expected to contribute to this highly theoretically anchored series of discussions that asked more questions about China's perspective of history other than their own. It was also about the lack of time and interpersonal sincerity and equal collaborative participation that made a large number of the artistic communities in Vietnam and Cambodia feel like they were, yet again, mere props for a very well-rehearsed play that spoke about them, not with them. And the Chinese wanted the international accolade more than they wanted to sincerely and genuinely march on a road where their own sense of time and urgency would have to be realigned. Soon after the residency intensive in July 2009 in Beijing, I decided to relocate to Ho Chi Minh City to take up the directorship of San Art. And the week before I left, a very good friend and very well-respected Chinese artist and curator sincerely challenged me by asking, what are you, a curator or a social worker? And it has been a question that continues to resound in my head. If desiring to work in contexts where access to critical resources are null, where artists are resilient despite these odds and thus seek to have their stories and experiences heard on a local international platform, if working in these environments means that as a curator one must help that artist understand the international context of where their work is about to be exhibited, and why. In return, curators also relearn methodologies according to different locales, different local contexts. That as a curator, to sit with a group of artists and encourage each other to work through our relationship to self-censorship in the face of a society governed by heavy political restriction. That if you desire to introduce other artistic ideas as forms of knowledge production in the face of a great public lack of access to resources, if you picture a world where globalism can nurture new discursive and financial models of localized knowledge and art production, do we call these curatorial strategies, often dependent on the ethos of collaboration, do we deem this as social work? Does the concept of cross-cultural artistic engagement necessitate social and political negotiations that demand psychological reassessment? In my experience, yes. An experience that particularly came to the fore in the creation of San Art in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. So here we have the opening night <coughs> of the very first exhibition at San Art on October 3, 2007, in Saigon, which was a very significant moment. The crowds that gathered for the event were an eager and genuine lot, buzzing with the energy, keen to embrace the social friction 
that came with combining three tiers of the community, local, foreign, and Viet Q. Now, Viet Q literally translates as Vietnamese sojourner, commonly referring to the overseas Vietnamese diaspora, particularly the boat refugees of the Vietnam War. The Viet Q community until the mid-2000s were heavily ostracized by locals and government alike. And this has greatly changed with the need for specialist expertise in trade and communications, qualifications earned by Viet Q abroad and now employed within Vietnam. And this is greatly contributing to a positive and inclusive national shift in social attitude. Had you been a Viet Q and living in Vietnam in the early 1990s and you wanted to take a train to Hanoi from Saigon, there would be two lines, one for local, one for Viet Q. The Viet Q charge price would be nearly triple that of the local. Things have greatly shifted since that time, and since Sound Art has been established in 2007, our audience reflect the great shift in social attitude that is actually having an effect on infrastructure inside the country for the visual arts. So this first exhibition at Sound Art showcased the skill of Saigonese draftsmen. And it is to this constituency, the local, that Sound Art has continued to nurture and promote. As an artist initiated independent non-profit contemporary art space in Reading Room, Sound Art, of the Sand Means platform, offers a space for artists to participate in and collaborate and equally transform, operating as an essential hub for experimentation and the meeting of talent both local and foreign. So the personal reflections of the Viet Q artist founders for artist founders on their experience of present day Vietnam, coupled with the great lack of contemporary art expertise and resources in the local community, were central to the founding of Sand Art. When Ding Kiu Le, whose work will feature in the next documenta, relocated to Saigon from the United States in 1996, he was struck by the resilience of Vietnamese artists who continued to create even in a country where humid libraries without Wi-Fi access offered little glimpse of the world post circa 1954. Where travel demanded so many cues, stamps, and seals that any hope of exploration beyond the borders was quickly extinguished by red tape. Ding Kiu Le remembers realizing how much of the distant and recent past was mentally constructed by artists who shared the same cultural blindness of the hand-painted propaganda signs that circulate continuously throughout the country. Tiffany Chung and Tuan Andrew Wun recall similar impressions of Vietnam. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> when they returned from the US in 2000 and 2004 respectively, they were fascinated by the ways Vietnamese past was being reinterpreted through popular culture, namely Korean, Japanese, and American music, film, fashion, and graffiti, and became interested in exploring how young Vietnamese were using gleanings from a mishmash of random decontextualized visual signifiers to come to grips with the country's history. So uh, Funam, another one of the founders, could relate to those who battled to make the inconsistencies of history profitable. A self-taught photographer who trained in Thailand in fine art conservation, he was fully aware of the controversial practice of making copies of art and artifacts as a strategy of cultural survival. He is an expert in making fakes. He's now one of the country's most prominent uh, directors of photographies for um, art house film in Vietnam. So determined to find some way to uh, contribute to the local art scene, Lei founded the Vietnam Foundation for the Arts, the VNFA in Los Angeles in 2006 with his LA dealer, Shoshana Wayne Gallery. Nonprofit status for cultural activities does not legally exist in Vietnam. The VNFA's mission was to promote and support the discussion and production of Vietnamese contemporary art and culture within and beyond the nation's borders. Its first project, a response to the limited textual and visual resources on contemporary art and culture in the country, was to establish a reading room in Saigon. However, finding a home for this contemporary art material proved inordinately complicated. As a Viet Q, Lei was treated with suspicion, and his project was ultimately buried in official paperwork. Frustrated, realizing not only the political limits of showing critical work in Vietnam, but also the social difficulties of being a Viet Q, it was a logical conclusion that four friends who shared similar backgrounds, interests, and motivations would come together to create their own platform for art. 
One of the most exciting aspects of the challenging new director position for me at San Art was not only my sense of this small organization's international potential, nor my belief that it served a crucial role in the diversifying landscape of Vietnamese contemporary art. It was the realization that I, as a museum-trained curator, would once again be employed by a group of artists in a communist country greatly lacking in any arts infrastructure, who were collaborating their own ideas and experience of contemporary art production to fashion a platform of their own. Not that it doesn't come with its own considerable risk and seemingly insurmountable obstacles. For example, in April 2011, Oh, let me just quickly skirt through the rest of these. I've just been sharing images of the history of San Art uh, to date, looking at some of our educational programming exhibitions. And this was a recent um, project we did last year where San Art smuggled 200 books into Vietnam from Hong Kong, from the Asia Art Archive in, America, in uh, Hong Kong. And it was a really fantastic uh, collaboration because I said to Claire, the founder, I said, I cannot guarantee I can get these books back to you because I don't know that I'm going to be able to get them out of the country again. And she said, no problem. Now for an archive to be open to that was really amazing. Um, we actually ended up being able to return all the books and the highly political stuff I shoved in numerous suitcases by various people going back to Hong Kong. <laughs> That's part of the work that we have to do in San Art. This is an exhibition, one of the first group exhibitions that we did in Hong Kong, 2009. Um, working at Tate Modern, 2010. Okay. So to talk about some of the risks and obstacles that San Art has to face in putting on its exhibition programs and education programs. In April 2011, Sanart, in conjunction with Sasa Basak in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, organized a solo exhibition by Khmer photographer Ratnavandi entitled Bomb Ponds, a project that will also feature in the forthcoming documenta. This single channel documentary video and suite of nine color photographs illustrates the bomb scars left behind by US bomb raids during the Vietnam War. Sorry, laryngitis last week, no voice, so lucky you guys get me talkable. I don't normally have such a sexy, deep throat. <clears throat> so, um, for this project, Ratnavandi interviewed more than 30 farmers, witnesses who recall the atrocity that triggered the rise of the Khmer Rouge militia and the ways in which these extremely large ponds have become a particular physical and psychological feature of the rural Cambodian landscape. These are images of the exhibition that occurred in Sasabasak in Phnom Penh. In order for San Art to secure the appropriate exhibition license, the Vietnamese Cultural Ministry threw an unexpected request on us. A signed letter of introduction by the Cambodian government vouching the integrity and value of the artist. Ratnavandi, being one of the few outspoken critics of the Cambodian government, understandably was not at all willing to seek such a document to justify the value of his work. This unexpected and never before requested procedure could be read in a number of ways. At that time, in April 2011, the Vietnamese government was anxious to not offend the US government for reasons of trade and influence in the South China Sea territorial disputes. Also, the Vietnamese government had only one month before threatened San Art staff with arrest for programming an educational talk of uh, Zhong Nam Ngo, a once anti-government writer. We were actually seeking to showcase his uh, fictional poetry, um, he's considered the, um, one of the key people to change the face of fictional writing in Vietnam, but the government chose to focus on the fact he's anti-government. It also, though, could be the fact that San Art, like Sasa Basak, is an independent gallery space that pushes the mission of independent thinking. Founded in 2011, Sasa Basak is the joining of two entities, Sasa Art Gallery, run by the Khmer artist group Steve Salapak, which translates into Art Rebels, and Basak Art Projects, run by Fulbright Humphrey Fellow, curator and scholar Erin Gleason. So they joined forces to combine Sasa Basak, which was uh, initiated from realizing emerging Cambodian artists needed commercial expertise in engaging Cambodian and international publics. 
and it's the country's only contemporary art organisation supporting curatorial and educational practices in the visual arts, doing exhibitions locally and abroad. So today, the collaborative practice between artists and curators in the establishment of contemporary art infrastructure, networks and projects in Asia is a dynamic innovation of Western methodology with local knowledge and practice, a collaborative exercise that is creating new definitions for the idea of curatorial labor, particularly. So we have Sasa Basak, which is an artist-founded group working with Erin Gleason, who is a Western-trained museum um, curator. Myself, museum-trained, working with four established internationally exhibiting Vietnamese artists. So it's the synergies between Long March Project, which is also artist-initiated, hiring a museum-trained curator. I'm, I'm looking very much at the model of these sorts of organizations creating critical think tanks in countries where engaging historical memory, historical consciousness is actually a very politically guarded topic. So to give further example of, of how censorship and um, political restriction affects curatorial practice and indeed artistic production, in November of 2011, Sanart held a solo show for Vietnamese self-taught painter Nguyen Thai Thuan, whose enigmatic canvases delicately, delicately critique the changing seats of power in Vietnam since the abdication of the last emperor, Bao Dai. This exhibition was a cunning juxtaposition of pre- and post-communist Vietnam, with Nguyen Thai Thuan manipulating his signature motif of the bodiless figure as a metaphor for the lack of substance he sees in contemporary Vietnamese society. A carefully engineered statement was written for the purpose of this exhibition license. However, the cultural ministry surprised us with their reason to censor the show as they stated, if you place objects of before and after communism together in the same room, you are giving space for critique, which they do not allow. You have to understand when you're, when you're working with the cultural ministry, you cannot be completely honest. For reasons, if you want your project to succeed, you have to use language in a very particular way. So we were really shocked and somewhat begrudgingly respectful of the fact that they were able to see the contrast in the work and what that meant to discourse. So here you have uh, pre-communism. This is taken inside Emperor Bao Dai's palace in Dalat, central Vietnam. And here you have on the left the slippers worn in Hanoi, northern Vietnam during the war, which were always made of rubber, very cheap. And then you have the American GI soldier boots in the south. And they were deliberately hung in such a way that you're arguing north and south Vietnam. Of course, I mean, for this particular exhibition license, I did not include this work. It was too obvious. But even with the rest of the work, they were able to pick up the contrasts. So they informed us we can only show the work that refers to before or after communism, not both. Considering that Sanart never receives explanation of restrictions, you know, we were impressed. <laughs> though concerned for what this meant for the artist and the show, where the contrast between these two time periods was absolutely crucial. Zanart decided to show all the work, placing half the work in our storage display area. And you can see, this is our, we're only 12 meters by five meters, we're quite small, but in the very back room, you can vaguely see a painting with a chair and a jacket on the back. In, that's what I call my storage area. <laughs> Um, so I argue that this back room is, is not a part of the official exhibition. Um, and for this exhibition, I wrote an in-depth critical essay for international audiences. I wrote two different press releases for local and international, and a very basic essay which was with no political content, and this latter one was what was published on the website. Now, the exhibition was one of the most successful local shows we've ever done. However, we were slapped with a fine for our method of showing the work, because I we did show everything. But more worrying was we were told to remove absolutely any textual information from the website, from the exhibition space, and any promotion. Now, in the desire to generate new audiences for culture, how can a curator speak about an artist's intention and perspective truthfully in Vietnam? How to encourage critical thinking when all forms of the written word lie under so much scrutiny? 
how to communicate and promote the work online internationally while also having to provide different information locally and not bring this difference of information to the attention of the government. We're still trying to figure this out. Ever since this exhibition, the Vietnamese Cultural Ministry have been particularly stringent on all our educational programs, limiting the number of people permitted on the premises to five at any one time without a license. Our strategy to cope with this crucially relies on collaboration with other local organizations whose commercial license, companies and organizations who do not have a cultural mandate, whose license serves as a blindfold for their hosting of, of our activities. So this means that in the last two years, Sanat has collaborated with uh, fabricators and held, and held meetings and educational programs in major factories for ceramic. Um, it means that we've collaborated with architectural houses and they say that they're actually holding training programs, but really they're actually holding very critical discussions for artists. Um, so we rely on these kinds of advertising, architectural, production spaces for the broader realm of thinking about uh, creativity to host really critical debates. And it's ironic that the government's restriction of our activities to curb public participation has actually caused our audience numbers to increase. For by holding our, our activities in different sites across the country, we plug not only our own networks, but the host's clientele as well. This may seem an obvious resolution to some, However, in my experience, there is a great lack of international institutional collaborative spirit in the arts that seems more determined to control the brand of their activities rather than nurturing and indeed promoting the access to cultural information for a broader society. And I do think it's important that you're given the chance to choose your cultural and collaborative partners because you have to be like-minded in spirit in order for it to be a successful game. So. <clears throat> what I'm sharing here is a really uh, what I think is a perfect little synopsis of how attitude can serve to create the form of engagement and it also demonstrates how crucial it is to engage on that level. This was a project done by Ratnavandi and Erin Gleeson in Phnom Penh um, and it's actually the results of a project that Daphne invited me to initially do in Thailand and Bangkok um, roughly about two years ago. So basically they interviewed various numbers of um, Khmer people and this particular man was 46 years old, um, a former Khmer Rouge soldier, bodyguard to the Prime Minister's cabinet and he was asked, how does Vietnam think of Cambodia? We are a province to them, they consider they own us. How does Vietnam think of China? Vietnam and China are similar, their food is even similar, China is the god to Vietnam, China is their teacher. How does China think of Vietnam? Well, Vietnam is their student. How does China think of Cambodia? Cambodia is a market to China, it's like the name of a mall, we are a place to sell their things. And I thought that this was actually a really important, succinct synopsis for why it is really important for culture to interrogate uh, historical memory and the kinds of social antagonism that can result from conflict and why it's important for art to be seen as a medium through which these kinds of attitudes can be broken down. However, to take this a little bit further than focusing purely on Asia and to step outside into uh, a scene or, or an artistic productive sphere that of which is very familiar in the Netherlands and indeed Europe and America, Recently, I was happy to hear that the Tate Modern have established adjunct curatorial appointments that employs local talent from the geographies their collections seek to represent without the need to remove them from their locale, which holds the very networks they live to support, such as Bogota-based Jose Roca in Colombia, who is now the adjunct curator for Latin American art to Tate Modern and remains stationed in Bogota. I see these kinds of appointments as mutual, crucial collaborations, for it not only gives great asset to Tate to have such access to local knowledge, but it also increases the scope of visibility of Tate programs in Latin America with its artistic producers. It also challenges the idea of what a global museum can be, a concept currently challenged by ZKM and its Art in the Global Museum, which has held several seminar and commissioned writings on the nature of curatorial practice and artistic production in the particular context of Asia as case study for rethinking museum strategies. 
This spirit of collaboration that respects the placement of knowledge and production is crucial to the development of a contemporary art in great parts of Asia, and for that matter, also the global south. There are very interesting conversations beginning between major institution and grassroots organization across Asia, Middle East, and Africa that will hopefully demonstrate that we do indeed live in the 21st century, where communication technology and outsourcing of production is the perfect climate for new modes of art institution. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> when new modes of art institution can, oh, where am I? New modes of artist institution and artistic production can flourish. It is such kinds of respect for local knowledge and the ethos of collaboration that will also further problematize this question of standard, quality, and rigor in the creation of artistic projects initiated by organizations that must desire local and international participation. I say must desire participation in both circles for reasons of economy, market, and the general historicization of visual art practice. It is this latter matter of history that needs to be thoroughly challenged and provoked across greater Asia, where the dominance of art market is causing a mass erosion of cultural memory and shared historical consciousness. This contemporary erosion, coupled with a great amount of regional cultural prejudice and antagonism, largely due to the exploits of colonial rule, war, economic disparity, and social assumption, is breeding a rising nationalism that prefers cultural elitism, red isolationism, as opposed to cultural openness. And this is particularly contradictory when daily life is visually confronted by a market openness that encourages international trade relationships and yet fails to acknowledge where those various trades are innovated or influenced through cultural custom or technique. For instance, I find it quite hilarious that right now uh, Chanel in Vietnam is showcasing the latest Bombay collections of last fall, of which all of the key jewels are heavily influenced by the Hindu traditions in India, and yet you will never see Hindu traditions culturally interrogated for the meanings of what these necklaces actually once were worn for, and yet you will find the extreme wealthy in, in Vietnam spending thousands of dollars on these sorts of necklaces and completely disregarding the own innovation of Vietnamese traditions in their own country. It's entirely frustrating. <laughs> So to conclude, collaboration in Asia within the cultural and artistic sphere between artists and curators, artists and businessmen, artists and politicians is the only way forward as it struggles predominantly without financial support and often under political or religious restriction. The brilliant diversity of the visual arts in this region holds important potential for the reconsideration of a system of creativity that builds on local knowledge. The challenge is in making that language on a truly global platform, to reinstate artists as critical spokesmen of social life and not just a fabricator of commodity. So that's, that's the end. <laughs> um, this is a, a kind of topic that is uh, really important for, I believe, models of arts infrastructure internationally because we, and of course in this context, in the context of the Netherlands where you guys are suffering major cultural restructures and budget cuts, um, how to remain relevant financially, you know, how can you be financially sustainable and still say critical things? How can culture be, con be seen as ambassadors of the ways in which the world can communicate and how it can break down assumed prejudices. I th get really quite alarmed with the way that a lot of the younger artists in Asia, and actually just last Thursday I was doing a workshop in Saigon. We just recently started a residency program where we've got artists from, at the moment, LA, New York, Hue, Hanoi, and Saigon in place, and the Vietnamese artists were, I was challenging them on why they should make art. <laughs> and they were very much like, well, I just want it to be bought. And the investment in understanding that their work actually has meaning, sadly, was, was, not, a, was not something they'd actually spent terribly much time thinking about. And then I heard, and it's a statistic I was just sharing with Harko, the LA artist shared with me that 
to every new university in the United States, there are 17 new prisons. So when you think about how education is starting to drop off the mark, how education once would support cultural knowledge and a form of historical consciousness that would become quite critical to thinking about your own relationship to not only yourself but all your, your region, how you relate internationally, to realise that those conversations don't exist either. It's only natural that the far right becomes more prominently in place politically. It's only uh, to be expected that we become more obsessed with how our borders can be controlled and ways in which we can uh, make money becomes less about the kinds of really creative projects you can do and more about how much return you're going to get for your buck. So I think we're at um, a really crucial juncture right now where we've got some of the most exquisite forms of technology to be able to really collapse those distances that we call global and yet at the same time we seem to completely deny the level of expertise required to make those tools really effective. So I believe it's really only through the process of understanding the ethos of collaboration that you can really create some very provocative artworks that can bridge those divides. <clears throat> anyway, I think I've just spoken enough. Over to you. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. <clears throat> if there's any question. If you don't, that's okay too. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I found it very, very interesting. Um, but I couldn't help but notice that when you mentioned two times um, Asian artists whose name, whose name I'm not going to try to repeat, um, but you mentioned two times that they were now part of the next documenta. I couldn't help but think is that, well, there's a certain contradiction maybe there because you also mentioned that you are trying to um, overcome this um, parameter of Western um, references or, or art historical concepts or um, symbols of, of artistic success, but then at the same time you have to because I mean, when they are shown there, it still, it matters or what do you think that... Um, do you I see never that as deny the no. role of the international. Mm. I'm, and I'm sorry if there's been a misunderstanding, yeah. I think that these exhibition platforms are important. What I think is particularly important that is the kinds of artworks and what they discuss inside those frameworks. So for instance, Dinkule's project for Documenta really challenges our understanding of the role of artists in Vietnam. It's a work that challenges the relationship between artists and warriors, artists and soldiers, because during the Vietnam War, artists were employed as soldiers and they were key morale propagandist figures at that time. So the piece really challenges the role of, of artists as uh, complex propaganda people. Ratnavandi's work um, posits a different kind of history for Cambodia that is not often written or taught about. And I, I do, I'm looking forward to seeing a documenta because I think that Carolyn Christoph Bakarev has a particular kind of take on history that does seek to speak back to the canon in a way that slightly twists. And I do think that it is important that artists from particularly developing countries and also the global south, I do think it is important that their voices continue to have presence uh, that is with proper research. You know, it's all too often that the intelligentsia of what we call curatorial practice just flies in and picks out the usual, you know, the usual and then they circulate. But I will never deny the significance of the history of art. It's about how to create, um, what I'm interested in is how can the global south set up its own frameworks and its own modes of language that can intercept that Western teleology. We cannot deny history, we cannot uh, overwrite it. We can only hope to set little arms and legs into it that point into other directions. And I do believe collaboration is where that has the most power. Mm. And the other reason I mentioned that those artists were in documenta was 
you guys are in prominent position to be able to go to Documenta and now you can go and you see these artists and you're like, ah, okay, I now know, I've heard a bit about them. It's more just pointing out for your benefit. People like me don't get to go to Documenta very often, it's very far away. Mm. Can you also talk a little bit about cultural protectionism in Cambodia and <coughs> Vietnam? Because in China, what I noticed was a lot of the contemporary art market was stirring up simply because state-owned auction houses were jacking up the prices so they can buy back their bronzes. Um, mm. Or the less antiques or less excavations there are, the more circulation is allowed for contemporary art, for national representation. So there's this really pervert relationship between the mm. supply and demand in relation to cultural protectionism. Did you notice? Yeah, in, in Cambodia it's really worrying because um, Angkor Wat is controlled by uh, the Japanese. Uh, it's the Japanese that hold the, um, the security. Um, the Genocide Museum, which is where S21 is the most notorious prison during the Khmer Rouge militia, it was where the most horrible tortures were carried out. And this is actually a genocide museum started by the Vietnamese, and that's controlled by the Vietnamese. Then you have all of the major, um, <clears throat> like the main museum, which is a really beautiful um, museum. It's been largely sponsored by the French. Um, and then the Koreans are, North Korea particularly, has investment in uh, Cambodians development on a civil infrastructure level and they are starting to have a role in <clears throat> in politics actually that's what I've heard I don't know how true that is but it is I have heard that Pyongyang officials do regularly travel to Phnom Penh because it's one of the rare communities of exiled Pyongyang that are permitted contact with officials inside North Korea so, as a climate of culture, it's very much governed by non-Khmer. And cultural protectionism is an assumed stance of the foreigner rather than the local. And it's really responding to that context that Steve Salapak, which was prior Sasa Basak, it's exactly that uh, condition that they respond to because local artists are very much aware that their people have no recourse to owning their own archives, owning their own newspapers. Well, there's two to three Khmer newspapers, but they're very underfunded. So it's a really big issue. The role of the NGO in, in Cambodia is, is, whilst it's investing a lot of money into preserving, it's dictating a certain perspective that is not generated from uh, the Cambodian people. Mm. Any more questions? <clears throat> maybe I have one, but it doesn't, maybe not necessarily a question, but I wonder if, if you or anybody else here maybe has the necessi ne necessary historical knowledge. But it seems to me that this is a region that is heavily dominated by one big player being China. Mm -hmm. And then your research is about how do the smaller players, how can they escape from that dominance and, and reclaim their own um, discourse and their own history. Um, would there be a historical parallel to um, Europe during the Cold War or after the Cold War when these countries were given back their autonomy, so to say, but whereas we still know that, that they are still mo <coughs> mostly puppets of the, of the Russian regime today? Mm. Or sh do you think there's a similar research to be done there? Definitely in Eastern Europe, for sure. Um, Romania has been um, one identified country to Vietnam that, um, I can't remember the name of the artist initiated organization in Romania, but there was one there that were, um, there's a curator, Vietnamese curator in Berlin who was doing research in Romania and had set up a collaborative project between um, Vietnam and, and Romania. And there's a, it's very interesting research there, yes, for sure. I mean, in the context of Vietnam, 
who suffered a civil war. People don't normally think about the fact that the Vietnam War was a civil war. So there's also connections to Lebanon um, and how um, the civil war in Lebanon was also internationally misunderstood and how that affected local production at the time. There is so much research to be done in cross-global south uh, contexts. It's fascinating. I'm really just desperate for more people, more uh, curatorial interest in the region so that these sorts of um, projects can be done. Yeah, a lot of work to do. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So please join us for drinks then downstairs. Thank you all for being here and thank you Zoe for your very thorough presentation. Um, the colonial aesthetics of China is obviously not unlike some of the colonial aesthetics we've seen from this part of the world. So it's an experience that this continent <coughs> has gone through and now we're actually watching China applying a similar experience, which yes. is fascinating. Okay, see you all downstairs. Thank you. Mm -hmm.